What's the deal with airplane peanuts? Is there, um, in your experience, any advantage of wearing the headphones if it's just us in here? Yeah, I mean, it's like more focusing and... Uh, I'll try it out. It sounds cool to hear your voice. Never done the headphones. That's what Joe Rogan does. Yeah. Oh, this is weird. Yeah. Well, this is what it's going to sound like to the people listening. That's true. Okay. I like it. This is strange. I'm going to probably comment on this a few times in the beginning. I guess we'll just get started today. My guest today, uh, you all know him from Kill Tony, just got done opening for Joe Rogan, uh, Hans Kim. Hey, what's up, guys? Good to be here. Great to have you here. Thank you for uh, making time for me uh, on this trip. Thanks for having me. Uh, this business park is kind of, kind of a crazy thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, they don't advertise it. No. And I went into, because I couldn't find this building, I went into three different stores around here thinking that they'd all know where each other are. None of them have heard of this or, or knew where it was. <laughs> um, so I was really just running around, very sweaty. Yeah. Um, first time wearing headphones. So kind of on the fly here, but um, happy that you're in here. And, yeah. And um, I just want to talk mostly, I think, about your, your story um, from van life to arena life. Uh, yeah. Private jet life. Yeah, I'm rich now. Yeah. Filthy rich, open for Rogan. Yeah, I'm uh, pretty successful. Yeah. One of the best in the world. Mm -hmm. No, I uh, don't feel like it's real. I feel like it's all going to get taken away at a moment's notice. But like, at least I could say I did it. You know, like I can yeah. retire happy now. Like, what did you used to do? Oh, I did arenas and private jets. That's crazy. I don't think it's going to get taken away, but that has to feel crazy that it happened so fast. Yeah. You know, um, so... From the first time you went on the Kill Tony show, yeah, what was that kind of like walking, you know, you sit in there, you don't know if you're going to go up or not. Yeah. But obviously, you've been doing stand-up for a while and have your tight 60 seconds. Was it a debate which 60 seconds I'm going to do? Or did you know, if he calls my name, these are my best three jokes or so? Yeah, I had a good idea. I got it called up once and then uh, the second time it was a little bit more of a struggle, but then it's like what you're feeling in the moment and what you think your best jokes are, kind of different things. So you feel it out. Do I want to mm -hmm. do stuff that uh, is like my best stuff overall or like stuff that I can tell really well right now? So I did a little bit of both. Um, but yeah, I mean, I was uh, moved to Austin um, during the pandemic, I mean, everything was topsy turvy. Nothing was open. Things were like, you know, weird. So I was like, let's just go to Austin. Yeah. I don't care if I get anyone sick there. Neither do they. <laughs> yeah. It's like where we all agree that we're going to tough it out. Yeah. So, like, I'm not living with my parents. So I'm only going to get other young, healthy idiots sick. That's how I felt in Florida. Almost the exact, <laughs> exact same thing. Yeah. So, Doing Kill Tony, being up there for your for the sixty second, um, sixty seconds that you have, do you think it's harder to do that because the room is filled with other hopeful comedians that want to get up there, so they might be either more judgmental of your jokes because they're comedians, or not paying attention because they're nervous that they're going to go up next. Um, how is that room when you're up there for that show? It's in Antones. It was mostly just, I mean, in Vulcan too, it was just mostly normal people. Okay. So you, they're so normal. It's like, they're not comedians at all. Mm. So they're a little shy. They're a little unsure of themselves. They're a little like, you know, they're, you got to handle them with kid gloves. And then once they trust you, then they'll start bellowing it out. Like they have no, it's either zero or everything. There's no middle ground with these. Mm uh audience members so then you do it the first time you do it the second time how many times did you just get pulled randomly before you became a regular i think twice maybe twice. three times okay once i did it in la in like 2016 or something oh wow do you so how long have you been a fan of the sh of the show probably before? like three years two yeah. years um I listened to like a lot of the episodes back to back, you know, mm -hmm. it was great. It's like a celebration of humanity. Yeah. Me and my friends used in college used to put that on the TV and just for hours watch yeah. it. We would not even watch it weekly. So we had more than one to watch at a time it's just to binge it. Is, does it feel weird becoming from a fan of the show? And now you're a char character. Obviously you're not a character, but a character on that show. Yeah. I'm a, uh, yeah, I'm like a recurring character cast yeah. member. Um, but yeah, it feels awesome. You know, it's like, it's not even real. Like, it's like, 
is it the same show? I mean, it's changed states. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. It just feels different. But yeah, I mean, it's a huge honor. Like, I love it. It's like, it shows you people, how different people act. And uh, like, it's a crash course in what people are like. And Tony's so good at making fun of them and how to like make fun of them and yeah. how to process people because yeah. he just processes people. So it's like, it's a great skill to have. And he knows so much about every sort of like <laughs> culture or any sort of stare. Like he know he has these jokes about such specific things. I feel like that you have to be almost like world educated on to even think of these jokes. Like some things go over my head just because I don't even get the reference. And he seems like he can make a joke about any sort of person about a specific thing um that's it's almost like an educational thing in a certain way yeah i mean everything comes into play when he's making fun of them every little part of his life mm -hmm. informs that so you get to see a peek into his mind yeah and it's great so writing for so becoming a recurring guest and then having the 60 seconds to do every week writing those jokes how does that is there a difference between writing your 60 seconds for your recurring guest spot and writing your maybe longer material? Or do you think that your style is in that short punchline anyway, yeah. so it doesn't seem to matter? I don't really change it up. I do the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I try to do the same thing. Uh, I just uh, write however I normally write, how I did for open mics. I think open mics are a great training for that kind of format because yeah. there's that pressure to come up with new stuff. People are watching you. Uh, every week, so you don't want to make your friends listen to the same jokes over and over. Right. But um, yeah, I mean, it's similar. Uh, the, but yeah, I mean, obviously, this is like a real audience. Uh, they're not as grumpy. So it's just, you got to account for that and, you know, be, maybe be a more kinder mm -hmm. person than open mics and, yeah, not shock them too much. Right. Or at least in the beginning. Yeah. If, um, if you're so you're up there and obviously it's a room that you're performing in for a open mic or a regular show it's just those people you might be filming it to put on your own platforms but when you're doing that show kill tony you know it's these people in this room but it's also hundreds of other thousands of people that are i don't know if that sense made sense hundreds of thousands of other people that are going to see it after this and listen to it you know for weeks to come yeah um so is is that pressure different knowing that there's a way way bigger audience like this audience that you see with your eyes is just the tip of the iceberg compared to you know the comments that you could get or or feedback that you could get online yeah it was really nerve-wracking when i first did it i was out of breath i ran up on stage um, it's funny when the people run up when they get called out and they yeah. sprint up on stage in the first 10 seconds it's just <sighs> <sighs> yeah yeah because they're so excited yeah. they don't know what to do uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, the real audience is back home. Uh, I mean, not the real audience. Uh, the audience back home is definitely a consideration. Uh, but I really can't focus on that. I just got to focus on the audience there in front of me. And if I can make them laugh, hopefully I can make the rest laugh. But they're yeah. a good indicator. So do you, is, how good of an indicator is Kill Tony in general, being a regular on that show, to try out new 60-second uh, bits of yours you write them down you get to try them there and then do you use that as maybe a test run to see if that's going to work in your other shows outside of that or do you test them in other shows to see if it'll work on kill tony yeah i do it that way i don't because okay. kill tony is forever Bigger platform yeah yeah and people are going to watch it in the future so i want to make sure it's ready that's your best yeah, yeah. But sometimes it doesn't always happen but maybe they'll enjoy the fuck ups yeah they get a peek behind the curtain that's something i've noticed from even going to shows um last night i went to stand up on the spot at the festival during this festival and some of the funniest moments were when a comedian's up there trying to make a joke and it, maybe it doesn't go over that well, flops a little bit. And just there, them like acknowledging that and just being like, all right, I'm moving on, I guess. Like that, then that gets the biggest laugh almost. Like yeah. it's, there's a certain thing of like acknowledging if a joke doesn't go that well, that is almost funnier than the intent behind that joke. Right. Because if they could just go back or they go past it, then it's like... Oh, are we? Am I feeling it wrong? Mm -hmm. Is did I? Do we not just see what we just saw? Yeah. But if they acknowledge it, we could be like, oh, thank God, yeah, yeah, it is. And what? it's a looser thing, and you can tell they're more 
comfortable or and they're not just taken so seriously and yeah. that's good for comedy yeah so come so this this whirlwind of success that you've kind of been experiencing in this short amount of time how do you how does it like i can't even wrap my mind around how your legs moved one foot in front of another going on stage opening for rogan in an arena like with all those people all those lights like how did you even how did you even get up there that's i mean might be a stupid question but it's got to be nerve-wracking yeah i mean it was fine i mean yeah it was a fun time you know it's more like you got to do it <laughs> like it's a job and uh you don't want to fuck it up but yeah i mean um yeah it was crazy but it was like yeah i mean it was in the round so i was standing here in the, the arena all around mm -hmm. and he was announcing me and I started walking up and then it, he did the announcement and I was still so far from the stage. But oh, then I remembered uh, Rich Voss told me, don't run up. It makes you look unprofessional. So I was just walking up and it took forever. And eventually I got up on stage and then they cheered. So in that span from the time he said your name to the time they could actually see you, were you just thinking, <laughs> I got to get up there? Like, but don't. Yeah. Yeah. And people were looking at me walking up, but I, yeah, maybe I should have ran. I wish I ran. That could be electric, kind of. You just running onto the stage. Yeah, yeah. I, so what I was, was better? Too, oh, you go ahead. I was too in the kill Tony mode. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I wasn't in stadium mode, but maybe it's hard to get time. in stadium mode. How is stadium mode? Like you have to do a circle while yeah. you're performing, mm -hmm. which is something that most people probably either never experience in their career or only do when they're 15 20 years in and they're like okay i've done a million shows now i can adjust to having yeah. a crowd all around me how is that it's different because uh your back is to the audience you turn around and there's people everywhere i was going from edge to edge just going all around and then all the other comedians were in the center just making a small circle so that's what i should have done <laughs> how was comparing the walkout to the arena, to you getting to do, I saw the walkout of like a UFC fighter at, at that UFC event. What do you think would be cooler if you were the fighter getting announced walking out like that, or if you were the headliner walking into that arena? Um, I don't know. I mean, fighting is like so much more visceral, uh, more physical, and it's like a different type of audience, different type of cheering. With the uh, comedy, it's like love and it's like intellectual respect. Mm -hmm. um, That's true because half of the, I just realized half the people in the arena, if you're fighting, are rooting against you. But yeah. everyone in the arena for a comedy bought the ticket to support you. So that's yeah. good. That is that's a good point. It's more artistic. Yeah. And if like you're Conor McGregor, I'm sure that feels amazing uh, walking in. Uh, but like, yeah, I mean, uh, as a comedian, uh is different because they're like okay now time to listen you know it's like mm -hmm. more intellectual more mm -hmm. right brain or left brain or whatever but like fighting you're just like you just have to watch it's simpler and then yeah. it's just like more animalistic you share the whole time you can drink the whole time yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's something i i've noticed but like doing open mics myself and then going to like a music concert like a rap concert and i'll be like man no matter how good i ever got at comedy i could never be as cool as what these guys do like something cool about just like people putting on a show where other people can be noisy and like loud at the same time it just seems more exciting i guess to me but then it's like but comedy is like you're it's a superpower you're making people involuntarily yell out you know noises yeah. so um think yeah exactly sort of feel so I also want to talk about the van life. That's another thing. Uh, my interview prep was a deep Instagram scrub. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you you lived in a van for what three three years? Four years. Four years. How did that? Because now it's kind of a trendy thing yeah. to live in a van. You can make a whole TikTok about it, and everyone's you know van life. Was that a choice of yours to be like this will be cute on social media or was this like i'm just living in a van it's just economically frugal yeah. it's like practical i can move anywhere mm -hmm. i don't have to have a job i can live anywhere i want uh just to do comedy it's yeah like simplify everything uh what do i really need a place for right. to sleep uh i can sleep in a car 
Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, like I don't need to have a nice place to sleep, you know, like that's not that important. Um, but yeah, I mean, um, uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's, it's sad that I had to do it, but I think that, uh, that's the kind of world we live in. So it's like, I'm going to judge, like, be like, oh, this is the game that we're playing. Okay. Let me, let me, uh, Exa yeah. put all my eggs in one basket. Like ideally we'd be able to house everyone without making them work a crazy number of hours. Cause then they could pursue their passion. But yeah, yeah. that's true. Is there parts you miss about it or no? Yeah, I mean, I miss not having to commute, just waking up in downtown, wherever. Yeah. Um, I miss, uh, you know, going to Mike's and seeing friends. Um, but yeah, I mean, overall, I wouldn't do it again unless I had to. Would you recommend that to people who are like, I'm all in on comedy, this is all I want to do, is stand up? Would you recommend that path of just like, this eliminates all the other bullshit from your life you can just focus on stand up yeah i don't think it's helpful to have a job that you hate i mm -hmm. don't think that's good for you i think you should do what you want to do and uh you know like torturing yourself and not sleeping is not good for you um i think a lot of work is uh you know like wasted it's just them trying to extract money from you it's not good for you it's good for them yeah that's true but what about the van specifically? Do you recommend that people start uh, aspiring comics start going with the van? Yeah, <clears throat> if you're good at it. <laughs> yeah, you don't do it if if you're you not have good. no shot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, I mean, uh, most people can make it. There's just like five or six in a scene that definitely can't. But if anyone wants to put that work in, then they can make it. But that's the thing. It's like most people don't want to put that kind of work in or make that kind of sacrifice. Right. Yeah. It's hard too. It's a hard thing because it's not just, you know, the stage time and the shows and hoping the shows go well and getting your clips out. It's also the the writing process can be almost the most daunting in a way because then it's just you against yourself, you know, and there's there's no excuse to to not do it especially if you have if you're a full-time comedian or or aspiring to be and give up your other pursuits of careers that you don't want and it's like all right i have to write these jokes but that can sometimes be the hardest part because that's when you really have to face uh inward and be like come out with it you know yeah. i feel like a lot of people can't get over that that part of sitting down and writing so for you is that just like this is my job i'm a professional or was it ever a struggle for you to, to start writing um, yeah every day yeah i haven't yeah i should write more but yeah, I mean, it's like uh, you have to do something uh, and, you know, like comedians are so lazy, like I don't, I don't do anything today. I got to do something towards comedy. People are, you know, in offices and jobs. They hate doing a lot of work for that. I should be able to motivate myself to do work for something I love. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> I think another thing is like people don't want to try and fail. It's better to not try and fail than to try and fail. But it's all it's better overall to try and succeed than to yeah. not try and fail. So I just feel like people don't want to be seen trying too hard because then if they fail, it's going to look ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, they, they, they don't want to like sacrifice their life. Yeah. They want their life to be as comfortable as possible. Yeah. And they can always hold on to the prospect of I could have done that if I wanted to, but I never right. tried. Yeah. They can yeah. tell themselves. Right. Yeah kind of validate themselves that way and i feel like there's a lot of obviously with social media now it's helped comedy so much and not even just comedy all art forms um with just creative people being able to show their creativity to mass people online it's a great thing but also i feel like a lot of people now are more um sheltered with their art or uh paranoid or self-conscious just from the people in their life that they you know they they are thinking oh these people are going to judge me for this or talk shit right. about this and it stops them from doing something that, that the they youtube might love comments to do. yeah exactly yeah so it's but that's like where you have to have a healthy disrespect of society like these people mm -hmm. love kim kardashian why, why do i care what they think about me yeah exactly and it's like i've yeah like these aren't even real people in your life you know yeah. most of these comments 
most of these negative comments, I feel like I, I don't even read the name. I just read what the comment says. So at that point, it literally is not even a real person. <laughs> it's just yeah. just the words. So let stuff like that affect you. It's it's kind of sad, but it's it's hard to it's hard to keep yourself in that perspective of why do I care about opinions of people I've never met yeah, or don't I know mean, or don't respect it's helpful. even. Yeah. Hateful comments are helpful because maybe they'll make you motivated to try harder or show you things that you didn't know about yourself. Hmm. Like you should use the society around you to help yourself instead of like, you know, keeping it to yourself. Because if you put it out there and you hear the critique, you can improve. But if you just keep it to yourself, then you're not uh, hearing that critique and maybe you could have gotten better if you just put it out there and, you know, used the people and their their attention to right. help you out. And there are people who really support and care about um, you and, and these people. On, or Let's say anyone gets a negative comment that they view as negative. It could be coming from an, a genuine fan who has followed along the whole time and thinks actually thinks like, hey, I think this might be better. This might be an adjustment. Um, so I guess to maybe block yourself off from all criticism and just be in an echo chamber isn't isn't healthy just like taking everything at the, at its word is is also not healthy yeah <clears throat> online is weird it like dave Chappelle said twitter's not a real place like it, it's it's weird though because it really does feel real like i i deleted my snapchat for like three days last week just on accident i need memory on my phone so i got rid of it and then didn't re-download it for a few days and it felt strange yeah like i felt like i was missing communication with people i felt like i was walking around and like i want to take pictures of interesting like, things i saw and i was like this is weird, weird. snapchat i don't really use snapchat so yeah. i haven't been on it in a while but like, i guess yeah. people have different apps that they use yeah snapchat for me it came out when i was a freshman in high school and so that was i'm 23 now so that was seven years ago i think oh that's a long time but it's just became a way to communicate with yeah. almost like texting. Like there's really good friends I have that I would consider really good friends that I don't text them. I would just snap them. A, a lot of snap DMing now too. And like, um, I don't know. It's just weird. It's just like a, a way to disappearing communicate. disappearing thing that is attractive? Sometimes. Or just like the 24 hour disappearing. Or it yeah. just seems faster, which... It's not, but it seems faster, I think, because it does disappear. So it's like, right. you know, that they're... You got to look at it and it's yeah. momentary. It's like not recorded forever. Yep. Oh, he saw this at this time. Yeah. It's just like, oh, I saw it. Like, you, you can't you be know. like, oh, this guy always checks my messages right away. What a loser. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, or like, if you get one back and let's say like it's someone that you just want to wait a few hours to respond to or you don't want to respond right away or maybe you're doing something... Like you gotta let it sit there and not open it because then they know exactly when you opened it. So then it's another, personally, I don't like notification badges anywhere on my phone. It drives me crazy if I even have like a one next to my text. I like to just clear all of those off. So <laughs> I don't even know why we're talking about Snapchat, but. Um, well, I think uh, we're talking about like the Twitter is in a real place. Oh, yeah. And it's like, I think uh, the internet is intellectual and we're used to the physical world, but like thoughts and ideas change mm -hmm. so rapidly. Like one minute, everyone loved Will Smith and the next minute they don't. Yeah. So if you're like on Twitter, you're like, oh, this is, you know, Will Smith is like this. And so like our minds are such malleable things. And then Twitter is just a representation of that. Of how the, it all kind of shifts. And it's kind of like cool watching <coughs> everyone's brains shift yeah. together in a way because Twitter seems to be somewhere where public opinion is king or it seems to be like it's more of like tmz yeah or yeah exactly and it seems like everyone has the same take i feel like on twitter yeah i mean our minds are changing we're like is this the right answer we're figuring it out like mm -hmm. oh everyone thinks this way so this must be the right answer yeah. but that's not necessarily always the case i mean it's some it's most of the times correct it's kind of cool to observe that as a third party like pretending to just take yourself out of it like if you weren't a human and just take yourself out and just watch what humans do on yeah. these apps. It's super interesting just yeah. to see how that how that all works. I mean, we have a culture, we have a shared consciousness. Yeah. And uh, a lot of people don't want to admit that because they abuse it for their profit, but yeah, I mean, that's where our minds are at. Like that's what it looks like and a lot of people don't like that. They don't want to admit that. They they just want it to be the physical world or like oil or whatever. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that our minds are, or Twitter might be a bad place just because like economically or socially we're in a bad place. I don't think the concept of people talking to each other is inherently going to be a toxic thing. Right. So it is almost a direct reflection of where we're at with right. everything. It's almost just like the country vibe check. Yeah. Or world, I guess. Yeah. It, it's something that like you couldn't even get rid of because it seems like it's causing some problems now and has some great aspects too. But if you were like, all right, let's let's pretend you're like, all right, Twitter's caused too many problems. We're just going to get rid of it. It's too late now. Like it's almost necessary to have some sort of open forum, town square area where everyone gets to share their ideas. Yeah. Like it's there's no going back from having an outlet like this. Yeah, it'd be weird if we did that. It'd be authoritarian. It'd be weird like, to yeah. take it away. And right. it's like, no, Twitter's not even a big social media thing. It's only like fourth or fifth. Like Facebook has way more. Instagram has way more. It's like, but the idea that it represents is good because like you go there just to like, you know, type out little ideas and then the best ones hopefully get shared the most. Yeah. Would you say that's your number one app or no. social media? Instagram is. Yeah. Yeah. Why is that? Uh, it seems like that's where the most people are. Mm -hmm. uh, Facebook is kind of dying off slowly. It's more for older people now. And it's like too toxic. I think Instagram is newer. Like Instagram doesn't have all that old sludge, yeah. old habits. People approach it differently. I've never been... I, I made a Facebook account to find my freshman year college roommate. And then once I found him because we had to join this Facebook group. Once I found him, I don't think I ever went back on. I don't really even know how to navigate the the scene yeah. on Facebook. Um, it's almost overproduced. There's too many options. You can get too connected, but Instagram is sort of like, it's harder to connect with people. Like you can't create events or groups or stuff like that. Yeah. You can have like group chats of 30 people. Mm. But yeah, I mean, you can't have groups or pages or stuff. So, so it's almost like, like just like the dumbed down version of Facebook. Yeah, like simplified. Sounds good to me. I'd yeah. say that has to be my favorite app. Yeah, this, it's weird. Like the more features that are on it, the worse it is. Like Snapchat. Like Yeah, it every disappears. update, it seems like people are complaining. and compl Every single time they update, try to make it fancier, everyone is just say, giving me, yeah. give me the old one back. Yeah, like we don't want the most fancy shit. We want like sort of something that reflects our broken minds. Yeah. Do you think that part of that is that we just don't like the cha like change of any kind? I think it's just like we don't want to know ourselves that well. We want it to be sort of unknown. Like who we are is sort of like, I'm kind of like this, but I'm kind of like that. We don't mm -hmm. want to come down definitively and be like, I'm pro-abortion or something. Right. And knowing yourself completely seems like a, a good goal to have, but also could be maybe scary for some people as well. Yeah. I mean, we have to have the ability to change. We can't just be like tied to what we wrote and stuff. Yeah. Well, that's funny because I feel like over the last few years, people don't want to give anyone the opportunity to change or prove, or they don't even want to think that there's chances to change. Like people getting called out on stuff they've said 15 years ago, 10 years ago yeah. for tweets, texts, or... Even, I, this is old, but like Kevin Hart getting removed from whatever hosting gig that yeah. was for a the gay Oscars. joke. The Oscars. <laughs> and it's like, I don't know, comedy, when he said that joke, most, I was watching Seinfeld last night, the episode where uh, the writer thinks that Jerry and George are gay and does the article about them. And they keep saying, not that there's anything wrong with that. And I was watching that episode and I was like, there's a lot of stuff that they would never put on TV. I don't even think it'd get monetized on YouTube in this Seinfeld episode. That's a very clean sitcom laugh track sitcom. And that's the eighties. Like those, all those jokes are, are fine and, and dandy then. So that's just how comedy has progressed a lot to what we put on TV or, um, it, it's just weird to think that everyone wants to say that they can change and give other people the benefit of the doubt, except for, I guess, with jokes, I, or it seems. Yeah. I mean, I think we're coming from an old way of doing things where we didn't have this treasure trove of information on everyone. Mm -hmm. So whenever something came out about someone, it was like a bigger deal. But now we have everything and we're still adjusting to being like, oh, a lot of people said a lot of crazy shit back then because times are different. Yeah. Uh, could I get a Kleenex? Um, 
I don't have a Kleenex. Okay. I, I can I think rip off a piece me. of paper. <laughs> um, hopefully someone brings you a Kleenex. Here we go. Thank you. This is the Kleenex break of the podcast. We do this every episode. <laughs> Sponsored by... Kleenex. Isn't that funny? Uh, Kleenex, that's a brand there who yeah. took over the name of tissues. Yeah, they made unbelievable tissues. And now you don't even... No one says the word tissues. It's just Kleenex for every brand. Although I could not probably name more than one tissue brand anyway besides Continel. Kleenex. Continel? Continel. I think that's oh. more toilet paper. Yeah. But they call that toilet tissue, bath tissue. <coughs> what, what, there's, what is it? it? No one writes toilet paper on the, on the <laughs> it says like bath tissue or uh, something. Yeah. So I guess it's all tissue. That was my tissue riff while Hans <laughs> blew his nose. Um, let's see what I wrote down to talk about. Oh, the before thoughts. Oh, here we go. How did the kissing thing start? Um, well, they realized that I'll just tell them anything they want to hear. And then they started asking me about my love life. And then I was like, well, you know, like I'm trying to, you know, fuck comedians. And then they're like, cause that's who I'm yeah. around all the time. And then they're like, let's bring one out. And then they were like, is she here? And then they're like, yeah, she's here. And then like, she was sort of like, oh, gross. He's, he's wor the worst. I hate him. And then they're like, does anyone want to kiss him to like kind of balance out the, yeah. the fact that she was clearly not attracted to me. <laughs> and then uh, that girl kissed me. And then like every week, Tommy was like, is it okay if I do that every week? Uh, some people are weird about their moms watching or whatever. And I was like, yeah, I mean, I uh, don't live my life in a way that my mom like she's not like the uh one, one person that i'm trying to impress you know i kind of mm. need to live my life so uh but yeah i mean he started doing it every week and uh it was fun and then people stopped wanting to kiss me for whatever reason <laughs> maybe because they saw the 30 other ones beforehand yeah <laughs> has your mom said anything about it or no. about the career in, in general no i haven't really talked to her about it but uh, yeah, I mean, um, I'm sure she she knows mm -hmm. in general. That was that was one of the best long running bits I think they've ever done. Um, so yeah, that that and um, do you, is there is there any sort of like do you, do you watch people go up to kill when you're there and and do you know oh this is going to be good or this is going to be bad right away just based on being around the game for so long. Um, no, I try to be open-minded, mm -hmm. but usually you can tell, uh, after the first joke, how quickly they get to it. Mm -hmm. But sometimes people have long jokes that are good, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, it's tricky. It's, uh, it's hard to do, you know, sometimes I'll think they sucked, but everyone else think they did well. So it really depends. But. Do you root for, I, you seem like you root for everyone to do well, but I'll ask him, do you root for the, uh, the person that kills or the person that has the funniest exit interview because they didn't do so well. <laughs> I would rather have them do a funny interview yeah. because then I don't feel comedically insecure. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. But that's really not the best for the show. So I try to temper, like it doesn't really matter what I want. Mm -hmm. I, what I want is like fucked up and stupid. <laughs> uh, but I would ideally want for me to be the funniest person yeah. on the show, which doesn't always happen, which makes me sad. But you know, I try to be the funniest in the minute, and then the interview is sort of like a uh, break. It's like, oh, thank God. Okay, I got that done. Let's just have fun now. Yeah. Was um, was that how it was the very first time going up? Like, oh, the interview's going to be the break part? or Because for me, I would think the most terrifying part of going up would be, all right, I know if this 60 seconds is going to be good or not. I've said it 500 times in 500. I know if this is going to be good or not, but... I don't want to get roasted on Kill Tony by all these comedians that I admire. And I think that would be my most nerve wracking part would be the, the interview after. Yeah. I mean, there's really nothing I, like most people can do about it unless you come with a prepared story, which they can sniff out right away. That's the, be that's the best when they try to like lie or be funny in the interview. And 
uh, it just gets shut down so fast. Like, yeah. Let us tell the jokes. That's I love it. Yeah, because I hate it when people do that in normal conversation yeah. when they just try to take over and grab as much attention as possible. It should be mm -hmm. like half, half, or like 20, 20, 20, 20. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, yeah, whenever people try to do that bullshit, it's annoying. So it's good that they get called out and they have to be authentic and in the moment. They can't just go into their rehearsed stories. Yeah. Uh, Who is the a guest that has been on the show while you've been there that you're like, wow, this is something special for me. Rich Voss. I mean, like he was good at it. Mm -hmm. um, Joe Rogan, obviously. I've been a huge fan of him forever. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I'm good. Um, Ron White. I see Ron White all the time now. Sort of weird. Um, Kim Congdon, Sarah Weinshank. I've watched them uh, at the comedy store, so I was like, kind of had a crush on them. Yeah, um, you know, Jetski Johnson. Mm -hmm. She's only been on the show for a little bit near the end of their time in LA, but I thought she was, yeah, really, really funny. She came up like almost in a blind spot of me for being a listener of the show. I was listening, and then I feel like I I stopped or. You just go through phases with podcasts, I feel like. And then I came back and she was there. So I didn't even know her origin, but I definitely enjoyed her episode. She was a great addition. And I loved the LA band, too. Yeah. That was the classics. The uh, the drum-offs, that was some of my favorites. The so. riffing, Joel Berg. Yeah. The Jeremiah, the characters. Yeah. The char yeah. That, that band will, is legendary, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So you're in Austin now. How do you like in Texas compared to the van in New York or just anywhere else you've lived? I love it. It's free. It's independent of all the bullshit. It's just a community that we created. Mm -hmm. uh, and we don't have to kowtow to any existing power structure. It's completely independent. So I love it. As far as the comedy scene in Austin goes, obviously there's a festival going on this week. So it's all over the place. What is it like normally? Is it like... I feel like people talk about New York, LA, and now, especially since the Rogan move, Austin as being that third comedy city. Maybe it used to be Chicago. Maybe there never was a true third. I feel like Austin is maybe not third place, but in that top three now. What is it like just a normal week um, comedy scene here? It's amazing. I mean, Joe Rogan flies out, Mark Norman, Ari Shafir, Shane Gillis. They come here a lot. Tom Segura lives here. Tim Dillon has a house here. Uh, some of the best comedians in the world mm -hmm. are on that Joe Rogan show. Um, you know, and uh, it's become really, really a good place for comedy. And with the Rogan Club opening up, it'll only get better. Mm -hmm. So this is like a place where you don't have to, um, you don't have to, uh, you know, have like a long track record of uh, slumming it in the clubs. It's, everyone's new here, mm -hmm. except for like the old scene, which is, they're great too. Uh, but yeah, this is like a new thing. It's not like, you know, it's not like LA or New York where people who kiss ass the best get ahead. Mm -hmm. This is just pure meritocracy. And it's attached, I feel like, from a lot of that New York and LA stuff of trying to get shows or trying to... I don't know. Just, like those two cities, the two biggest cities in the country, I, I just feel like there's just a different feeling or different culture in those cities, even outside of the comedy scene, just living there compared to being in a new place like this and setting up a new comedy scene where there's not as many maybe executives or Hollywood or people trying to tell you to be clean or change your act or stuff like that. Yeah. <clears throat> that's, that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's the best part of it. Um, yeah, I mean, everyone here is happy to be here. They escaped from wherever they were, and everyone wants to party and have fun. And people here are really nice to each other. Um, we party all the time. We like hanging out with each other. There's less jealousy. Um, it's a beautiful scene. That's awesome. What would you say your favorite room is around around Austin on a weeknight? Um, probably the Vulcan, just because I'm so familiar with it. The Creek has a good stage. I like that setup. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, the that's pretty much it. A Spider House Ballroom, I think, is wonderful because of the audience that they get is a little different from Creek or Vulcan. They're more the old Austin. Okay. Is there a you mentioned the old guys and the old Austin scene? 
is there so obviously there's comedy in every city to the people that were already here doing stand-up trying to get this scene off the ground when this flood came in of refugee comics what what was their kind of reaction like um the old scene was sort they just sort of huddled uh away and sheltered themselves from the storm and sort of uh you know, kept away, you know, some people bled through, but mostly they just kept to themselves and, you know, they have their own opinions. They're, they're more liberal and the new people are more conservative. But, you know, I think, uh, I think there was a lot of, uh, possibilities for, uh, you know, cross pollination. So I think, I think they're slowly, uh, opening up and the new scene slowly, um, ingratiating themselves with the old scene. Mm -hmm. That's good to see. Yeah. Have you have you noticed a lot of new, brand new people showing up that move here to Austin, thinking, if I'm here, this is where I'm going to become a comedian, and my problem wasn't that I'm not writing or that I'm not getting on stage. My problem was that I don't live in Austin, so if I move here, that'll be solved. Have you seen a lot of people that maybe? Um, aren't doing the work, but just want to be in Austin and be around comedy and be in the scene um, around here. Like, I feel like, I guess what I'm trying to say is I feel like the word Austin and comedy and all this, it feels a little saturated maybe to the outsiders who love comedy and don't live in Austin. It feels like everyone's like blowing a lot of smoke up Austin's ass in a way. Does, do you feel that is like, cause you're around these big names too. Um, I'm talking more like open mic level. That kind Are of there thing. a lot of like hangers on mm -hmm. and like weirdos? Yeah. Or just the people that are just flooding in here just to be around the Austin comedy scene and just kind of filling it up. Um, I guess it hasn't reached a critical mass. It's a good number now. Um, I mean, it's not really too many weird people. I think it's a, it's a tough city to uh, come if you want to just... Uh, you know, clout chase because mm -hmm. it's not that big. So I think that and uh, that helps people not be kind of weird about it. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I mean, I haven't noticed it too much, but I'm sure it'll happen more and more uh, once Rogan's Club opens up. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of people are like looking at Austin as like this new alternative. Like if they don't want to go to LA or New York. Because they're still obviously great <clears throat> things happening in both those places so it is i guess more of an alternative in, in that way yeah. because i feel like a lot of i mean if you listen to if you listen to jre if you if you just kind of a casual fan but more in the group that you are in and, and these guys it, it sounds like la is dead and new york is dead but there are still great things happening there in comedy yeah i mean uh we moved here so we're gonna talk shit but mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, you can't deny like the history of those cities. Uh, they're great cities. Uh, it's just like the cost is, uh, increasing and the benefits are decreasing and we don't need that old infrastructure. Comedy is just one person talking. We can do it anywhere. Mm -hmm. We don't have to, they, they, they're using it to control. Mm -hmm. Like they're using the name of LA or New York to get more out of people than they deserve and here like there's none of that this is just pure this is 100 percent efficiency yeah so you mentioned that you all you need for comp you can do it anywhere all you need is someone talking um you're running a, an open mic in a park for a little bit yeah um how, how was that experience doing comedy in a park it was awesome it was gorilla it was like you know hodgepodge it was crazy um we had a good time you know uh is uh I did mushrooms once and we just started a mic there and it was a crazy time. It was a great experience. Um but yeah, it was uh it was it was not the best place for comedy all the time. <laughs> was it hard to get people to like focus or like uh, sit down and 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 watch with you know being in a public place with other things going on? Like what time of day was this at? Like six. Six. Okay. So sun's kind of setting, but there's still other stranger or pedestrians you know yeah. walking around um i can imagine that that'd be kind of distracting pretty wild the first yeah. show i saw last night stand up on the spot was in an outdoor an outdoor covered venue it was like cedar um cedar street something yeah some and that was cool um there was a lot of 
different alternative shows during the pandemic that I saw. I saw Mark Norman also performing in a park. Um, was Would you say that open mic that you put on was the strangest place you've ever performed in your career? Yeah. I mean, uh, it's not ideal, but it's, it's got a mystique to it when there is a pandemic going on and you're like, oh, we're all out here. Yeah. It's crazy. So it helped that the pandemic was happening, but ideally you'd want to be inside. Yeah. Like no one would, <laughs> it'd be hard to get people to go to a park show now. Yeah. Than, than then. That's crazy. That is, cause I, and I also, that reminds me of, I think I was listening to Rogan to tell a story about Dave Chappelle doing stand. He would just, after he left the Chappelle show, just start doing stand up in, in parks and just yeah. out in public and people would kind of gather around and listen to him too. So, and obviously that was pre pandemic. It, there, there's something to, I feel like, being out out in public and drawing in a crowd right. that that has to feel almost like medieval I don't yeah know it's way. organic it's yeah. like comedy in the caveman era yeah but yeah people want to talk to each other people want to listen so it's like you know it's a great thing to do it's egalitarian it's democratic it's free mm -hmm. anyone can watch anyone who's there who's uh, made the sacrifice of being there physically in the in that space. Mm -hmm. That's all you need to do. And uh, I think it's a beautiful thing. Uh, and I'm sad that uh, it's gone now, but you know, uh, we, we can always do it again. It's just like, it's not ideal. Yeah, the exactly. Low ceilings help. Yeah. So <clears throat> there seems to be a different style. I was talking about this in my last interview of people from new that perform in new york seem to have punchier faster more jokey jokes and people in la seem to be more performative and maybe longer stories or personal anecdotes and i don't think that was the right word but from austin do you think that this is developing comedians um in one way or another do you think that it's just people are since it's new they're just coming with what they already knew and do you think that there's going to be an austin style in a few years yeah i mean every city has a style it's uh inevitable mm -hmm. it's hard for me to tell right now uh because it's so new but i would say that there's like a like sort of a southern thing going on here there's like a riffing is like you know more laid back and sort of like the southern you know drawl and mm -hmm. like uh what is sweet tea sip in on a porch kind of ad energy and attitude mm -hmm. and sort of like a cocky thing like i have a gun so i can do what i want so i guess it, it might just play to the crowd then because that seems super texas the new york style seems super new york and the la one seems what i'd imagine people there would, would enjoy too so i i guess that would just yeah yeah the audience is your guiding light so if you can't make them laugh then you're going to change your act to make mm -hmm. them laugh no matter what it is how do you figure that out wh while it's already happening because obviously you don't go around and shake hands with everyone in the audience and say so what do you like like what are your interests what stories would you what? just laughs or no right <laughs> the faces in the crowd how yeah. much they seem on board with it but in a packed room how like you can't see even half the faces I, I yeah i mean it's such a i mean when you're up there you have to be in tune with the audience so you're gonna feel every little thing that mm -hmm. happens like whoa that was a weird kind of laugh that corner was a little weird and then that's gonna work into your head subconsciously you don't even have to think about it yeah and the next time you you're like maybe i shouldn't do that joke that got that weird response maybe i should do this joke that got the better response uh -huh. and then slowly you, your style changes for the audience isn't that kind of a a dangerous game maybe to play because every audience is so different so what if that that one joke that you might have changed uh would have killed in in a whole different audience or a whole different city like how do you even determine i don't know like is, is it weird to be like is is this audience worth me changing for how do you not get defensive <laughs> and be like no it was them because i know that this killed two nights ago well, that's where your personal taste and intuition and your, uh, you know, your uh, desires come in where mm -hmm. you're like, oh, I like that joke. I think there's something there. It's like feeling it out. It's not right. always conscious. It's more like your, your emotions towards that joke. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, you know, and then you, f you figure it out, however, using a combination of uh, subconscious and conscious 
be like, that one got this many laughs. I'm going to stop doing it. Yeah. That's, that's so impressive. And I guess that's what kind of makes a professional a professional because it, like, I feel like it's so much easier or not easier, but just so much more, um, it makes more sense to, if you're nervous or if you're not experienced to be like, I got this tight five, I'm going up, I'm saying these words exactly how it happens. And I just hope that this audience likes it, you know, like no matter what show I'm doing, these, these are the sentences I'm saying, this is my five minutes and I have other jokes, but I'm not, I'm not prepared or I, I'm going to get too flustered to swap things out or know those pockets of problems in the audience. Yeah. I mean, uh, I am pretty scripted. I say the jokes the same way, but I choose which jokes to tell when and how to say it. So that's where my uh, audibles come in. Mm -hmm. But everyone's different. And uh, if you don't feel good telling a joke, then you shouldn't be saying it. You should be excited to tell that joke. And if right. you're not, it probably means you're not, you shouldn't be, you should be telling another joke. Yeah, that makes, that makes sense. It's very obvious. Would you say that there's jokes that, you're tired of telling at this point in your career yeah. that you know work and all just, of them. All of them. I hate. I wish I could just have a new act. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I feel like whatever. I'm hacky or stupid or dumb or whatever. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's like the negative voice. It's like you know these jokes work. They they're fine. Mm -hmm. They're not terrible. Yeah. All the time. But yeah, I mean, uh, <clears throat> I just uh, I. Uh, I, I would try to write, I try to use that hatred of my own jokes to write more new jokes. Mm -hmm. And uh, hopefully I write, uh, hopefully I can use that. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I get sick of my jokes. And if I'm not excited to tell it, then the audience could tell. So I try not to do jokes that I don't like. Right. And one last question for Hans, Kim. I just want to throw this out and then you can plug some dates or socials and all that. If you had any advice to give a comedian that was in your shoes three years ago, what would it be? Uh, I would say um, you got to love the audience. Uh, it's got to be coming from a place of love and you got to work hard at it. So both. It's kind of hard because if you love it, then... People are like, oh, I just have good emotions and feelings. I don't need to work hard. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you work hard, you're like, man, I worked so hard on this joke. They don't like it. Fuck them. Yeah. So it's like you got to balance it out, I would say. I mean, that's what I would say because I'm uh, autistic. <laughs> but yeah, that's what I would say. Okay. Awesome. Well, thank you, Hans Kim. Do you have any dates or socials that, that you want to throw out for the YouTube? Uh, DJ Hans Kim, I, uh, I'm going to Chicago, I'm going to Detroit, I'm going to different places. I don't know when or how, but it's going to happen. All right, so if you live in any different places, sometime he might be there. But thank you for coming in and <laughs> uh, for having taking me. this time. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you, man. Thank you.